Hello, welcome to Promicon. Today I'm going to talk about another big issue that many of you have in the process industry. It's not a specific issue that maybe is only affecting cement industry or power. It's basically affecting everybody that is using large ducts that carry gas flows. So basically all the uh, thermal process industry is affected by this. And what I want to talk about is a very common issue that prevents accurate measurement of gas flows. In our last video, I have explained our uh, measurement principle again. And, and if you have a look at our uh, measurement systems, like here, you can see that we are measuring with two sensors instead of one. And the fact that we're measuring with two sensors is an important thing uh, that will play a big role in today's presentation. Two sensors. Two sensors measuring the time of flight between sensor one and sensor two correlation measurement. And I will talk again about how exactly correlation measurement is working and how it helps you with your problem. But let's first address the problem that you have. I have taken um, an example here of a plant. This is a cement plant, but it could be any other plant. In this plant you can see there is a multitude of duct work. There are a lot of ducts coming from a raw mill, um, a kiln preheated tower or other process components. Now, the thing I would like to discuss with you today is the problem of swirl. All big flows have swirls in them. It's very rare that you have a large duct that has no swirl. Swirl means that the air as it flows is also rotating. So you do not have a specific point where you can put a sensor in and have a straight on flow directly onto the sensor. There will always be an element of lateral movement in a different direction. Yeah. Where does the swirl come from? Let's have a look at this plant. You can see in the stack. The stack is a huge um, duct and right upstream uh, you can find an ID fan. ID fan has a huge wheel that will start to push the air into the stack but it will also give the air a spin. Maybe you have noticed that in wintertime when you look up the stack and you can see the plume coming out, it's usually rotating a little bit because there's always swirl in the flow. But that's not the only, um, the only location where you have that. You also have swirls out of, for example, a raw mill. So you have a mill where you have a classifier that's giving um, the gas flow a spin and that spin, as it tapers down to the duct, will accelerate and you have quite a big swirl out of a mill, any mill. But also other things, uh, other process parameters. Look at the, at the kiln preheater tower. You have a lot of cyclones. Every cyclone is starting to spin the air and that gives you a gas flow that comes out of the cyclone, not in a straight line, but always with a rotation that you have to account for. So your measurement has to tackle this problem. Now, let's look at just normal ducts. You know, you might say, okay, I, I don't have a, I don't want to measure right behind an ID fan. I don't have um, uh, another um, uh, classifier. I just have a normal duct. But even in a normal duct, you have this problem. If you take a look at this manifold here, that's a typical duct arrangement in a power station, for example. If you look at the bottom, uh, you can see this great blue rectangular section. This is where the air is basically coming out of the picture towards you. Right? So we have a big duct that's coming towards you and after that it, it just turns 90 degrees upwards and then it branches out into five individual uh, ducts that go then to the boiler. Now let's have a look at the middle branch. In the middle branch, you can see from the CFD calculation that we have done that you have a fairly straight flow. This flow has no swirl. It's, it's a very straight uh, movement towards um, the burner. So it will be fairly easy to measure. And that's because the air comes towards you, makes a 90 degree bend upwards, and there it goes. If you take the two uh, ducts left and right of that, you would see that they have a fairly big swirl. 
where does this swirl come from? Of course, it comes from the fact that the air goes up, but then it also has to go sideways and into the duct. So you have several dimensions that you make changes in your direction of flow. And as gas has a mass, like any matter, it also has an inertia. Yeah? Gas has an inertia that wants to make it go in a straight line. Now, if you bend it in several directions, you automatically start to induce a screw movement. And that means the air that wants to move on like it has before starts to get a spin. It starts to get a swirl. So even ducts that have no ID fan, no um, classifier, uh, no cyclone, even in those ducts, if they bend around corners several times, you would end up having a swirled flow. How big is the swirl? No one knows. Where is the swirl occurring? No one knows. You can only speculate. Because in every turn, you also might have turning veins. Usually people don't know very well what degree of swirl they have to expect. So what do you get if you have a swirled flow? Let's just take a normal anubar or a normal um, venturi. If you have a swirl, you would have an additional kinetic component in your gas flow that will influence the delta P that you measure. If you take a thermal um, hot wire anemometer, for example, you will have an additional velocity component that goes over your uh, hot wire. So you will measure a higher cooling um, capacity or cooling power. Uh, and that also would give you a higher value for your flow. However, you are not interested in that. The thing that you are interested in is the flow that goes in the direction of the pipe axis. You don't care how much the air spins around. You want to know how does it go in a straight line parallel to the axis. So what you need is actually a vector measurement. You need a measurement that tells you only the velocity along the pipe axis. And for this, cross correlation measurement is very well suited. So now in our part two, I will explain to you how, how we get around that and how our system works. As I've explained before in videos, we are measuring the electrification of the gas in your duct. So we have gas flow that carries small particles which are electrostatically charged. And these gas particles, as they come by your antenna, they leave a mirror charge on the antenna. So as the particles fly by the antenna, they will leave what we call a time signature of their succession, of their time succession on our sensor. And this time signature is very unique for any given point in time. So if you have two sensors that are in line, in series, so to speak, and you have your gas flow going over these two sensors, what you will find is that you have a time signature on each sensor that is very similar. You can even see that if you put them on top of each other, you can see the two time signatures, very similar, but they are time shifted. And the time shift is what we can calculate using a cross correlation um, processor. And then you get the cross correlation function, which tells you the time shift from sensor one to sensor two. So what our measurement does, it gives you a time shift measurement every second. You get another time shift, another time shift, and another time shift. And what do you do then with that? We take this time and we take the distance of the two sensors to calculate the velocity of the gas flow. So you have a distance of, let's say, 350 millimeters. You have a time and then you take the 350 millimeters divided by the time. And that gives you meters per second or feet per minute or whatever. That distance. That is something I would like to discuss today because it's important for a good vector measurement. If we look at the two sensors, sensor one and sensor two, what is the distance that we are looking at and what is the flow that we are looking at? Let's just imagine that we have some flow that does not hit the two sensors in an orthogonal way. So it's not perpendicular on the sensors, but it has some angle, some offset that it hits the sensors with. It looks like this, right? So it doesn't go from one sensor to the other in the shortest possible way, but it goes in some way with an angle. That's what we measure, that's reality. Now, what our sensors tell us is a time. They don't tell us which path 
the particles are flying. They just tell us the time shift when they have approached from sensor 1 to sensor 2. That's the only thing we know. And then we assume a distance. We assume a distance that the, sen that the particles have traveled. And the distance that we assume is the one that you can see there on that blue line. That's the distance that we assume. The distance that's orthogonal on both sensors. The shortest possible distance between the sensors. That's the one that we are calculating with. So, the distance is a vector. That distance has a direction. The direction of that distance is orthogonal to both sensors. Right? So the result of it is that we have a velocity that is not just some velocity, but it's a velocity that's directly in line with that distance vector. And that distance vector happens to be parallel to the axis of the duct or the pipe that you're measuring. And that means we're measuring the velocity that's parallel to the duct axis. And by that, the lateral or the azimuthal component of swirl is eliminated. We don't see it. We don't measure it. So the correct velocity is the one that we are getting out in direction of the pipe axis. I would like to mention uh, another example of this, uh, and that's measuring on a stack. And that's very interesting because we have uh, a new system out, um, the Mekon Air Emission System. It measures the gas flow through a stack. And as I mentioned uh, initially, most of the stacks have an ID fan that's pulling the gas from the process and push it into the stack with a large rotating fan wheel. And that fan wheel gives the airflow a spin. So let's have a look at it. This is the spin that you see in the stack. So the air is not going up in a straight line, but it's going out in a spinning manner. Or if you have a look at it um, from the top view, you would see there is a swirl. The air is coming up in a swirl. So if you have your two sensors, the air will not go in a straight line between the two sensors, but it will somehow be a little bit offset. Yeah. But still here, again, because of our distance that we assume, which is the straight, shortest possible distance between the two sensors, we will calculate the velocity based on that distance vector. So we will calculate the velocity that goes parallel to the axis of the stack. No other velocity will be indicated. So also here, we will eliminate all the swirling movement in the stack and we will only show you the movement of airflow parallel to the stack. We've been done uh, doing uh, emission uh, certifications, uh, QAL1 certification, and uh, the Deutsche TÜV found that um, we are one of the most accurate uh, readings in a stack, uh, despite the big swirl problem, because our system is not affected by swirl. And in any other application that you have, you will not be affected by swirl, which is a very major reason why more and more people in the process industry buy our systems and go with our technology in their thermal processes. So this was it for this feature. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We'll be um, very happy to help you. We'll also be very um, eager and um, interested to look at your applications. If you have special applications, let us know what they are. And I'm sure that we can help you to find a solution to your flow problem. Hopefully, you'll be tuning in next time to our video. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you.